15 minutes on, um, should we say, Lord, if it's at the end of life. And of course, this is a, a perennially topical issue. And of course, particularly in Canada with the Carter case or the circuit of the Supreme Court, um, it is of particular interest to, to Canadians. So what I'd like to do in my uh, 15 minutes is maybe to touch on some of the moral arguments and legal arguments that have been made in favor of euthanasia, voluntary euthanasia, and physician-assisted suicide, both in the Carter case, but also more generally. And um, I'll explain why I think these arguments are unpersuasive. Now, if you want a fuller treatment of the issue, I could recommend this book, uh, Debating Euthanasia, published by Hart Publishers. And um, it's really a combination of two sections. The first section is written by Professor Emily Jackson. She's a professor of law at the LSE. And she puts a case for the decriminalization of, as she calls it, physician-assisted dying. And then in the second half of the book, I write 30,000 words against. We wrote our contributions blind, so I didn't know what she was going to say, although I had read some of her previous work and did reply to that in my section of the book. So you'll find that's a very good, I think, introduction to the contemporary debate, the contemporary arguments for and against decriminalization. Um, I'd like to start uh, by taking one argument that was at the core of the Carter case, one reason why Justice Lynn Smith of the DC Supreme Court found her right to voluntary euthanasia in the Canadian Charter. And it's really the main reason I think that Professor Jackson uses as well. The argument goes something like this. Euthanasia, uh, we understand by that the intentional ending of a patient's life. Um, typically because the patient's suffering. And euthanasia is a way of ending their suffering. Now, the argument runs that there's nothing particularly exceptional about euthanasia because doctors are ending the lives of patients every day of the week when they switch off a life support machine knowing the patient's going to die. That's the same as intentionally killing them with a lethal injection. When they administer palliative drugs to ease their pain, foreseeing that that may or even will shorten their life, that's the same as euthanasia. When they practice terminal sedation, they may reduce the patient into a state of unconsciousness and withdraw tube feeding at the end of life, knowing that their life might be shortened. That's the same as euthanasia. So what Professor Jackson uh, is doing is to assimilate the intentional ending of a patient's life, say by a lethal injection, with generally accepted medical practices, such as switching off ventilators or administering palliative drugs, which the doctor knows may shorten life. So that's the first question to consider. Is it the case that there is no moral difference between trying to end the patient's life and merely foreseeing or ending the patient's life? Now it seems to me that there is a big difference. There's a big moral difference and there's a big legal difference. There's a big moral difference between trying to bring about a bad consequence and merely foreseeing you're going to bring about a bad consequence. So for example, if you're unfortunate enough to have cancer and the doctor says, well, we can give you chemotherapy to cure the cancer, but I'm afraid you'll feel terribly nauseous and all your hair will fall out. I might say, well, that's the price I'm going to pay, so please go ahead with the chemo. And the doctor does so. We wouldn't blame the doctor, would we, for the nausea and the hair falling. <coughs> I think centrally because we know that's not what the doctor's trying to do to us. The doctor foresees that bad side effect. It's not the doctor's purpose. But if we thought the doctor was trying to bring about that harmful purpose, I think we'd have a completely different view of the morality of the doctor's action. And this moral distinction between trying to bring about death and merely foreseeing the bringing about death is reflected in the law. So there's plenty of legal authority, Supreme Court in Rodriguez, the Supreme Court of the United States in Washington and Glucksburg, the Law Lords, where courts have said there is a clear and important difference between trying to bring about death and merely foreseeing the short of life. So courts have said time and time again that it's perfectly proper and lawful for a doctor to administer palliative drugs to you to ease your pain even if the doctor foresees it will shorten your life. That's lawful, that's widely accepted as ethical by the medical profession. 
And the judges have drawn a clear line between that and euthanasia, where the doctor's intention is to shorten your life. Not really foreseeing the shortening of your life, but the purpose is to end your life. <coughs> so that's the first big question for you to consider. Is there, as Professor Jackson and as Justice Lynn Smith in the DC Court, the Supreme Court held, no real difference between <coughs> those kinds of medical practices? Or is there, as I think, and the medical profession thinks, and the courts think, apart from Justice Lynn Smith, uh, a significant moral difference and a significant difference? Now, I think a second issue I'd like to touch on um, is, the, is, is the following argument raised by Andrew Jackson and again echoed by Justice Lynn Smith. And it's this. The argument runs, look, suicide's been decriminalized. It used to be a crime. In many countries, by legislation, it's no longer a crime to kill yourself. Um, therefore, you have a right to kill yourself. And if you have a right to kill yourself, then surely you should have a right to be assisted to kill yourself. Or at least it should be permissible for someone to help you kill yourself. So the argument runs, suicide is no longer a crime, but assisting suicide still is. That makes no sense. Suicide is right, you have a right to suicide, then we must abolish the prohibition on assisting someone to help you exercise that right. Now the counter argument <coughs> is that suicide was decriminalized not as uh, a combination of suicide. Legislators didn't say suicide, we realize now is a good thing, you have a right to commit suicide, therefore we're abolishing the crime. On the contrary, the feeling was, well, we think suicide is wrong, but we don't think that the criminal prohibition is any longer the best way to help people who are suicidal. So we'll maintain the prohibition on assisting or encouraging suicide, it's not something wrong to assist or encourage, and we'll hopefully steer people who are suicidal towards psychiatric and <coughs> social health. That would be a better way of helping the suicidal. So the counter-argument is the decriminalization of suicide was not a combination of suicide at all. The law is not condoning suicide. And you'll find a very clear statement to this effect in the leading case of Diane Critty, where Lord Bingham, the senior law, made this crystal clear. The law does not condone suicide. There was no right to commit suicide. Suicide was decriminalized for other reasons. Uh, I think the third point I'd like you to consider is a point about slippery slopes, and I think this is really quite important, as important as the first two issues. Um, there are really two concerns about legalizing voluntary euthanasia in terms of where it might lead. The first <coughs> argument is advocates for voluntary euthanasia say we only want to permit it for competent people, we're only talking about lethal injections for competent people who are informed and autonomous and who clearly request it. We're not talking about giving lethal injections to incompetent people like disabled babies or old people with advanced dementia. It's respect for autonomy that justifies voluntary euthanasia. Well, the practical slippery slope argument says, well, even if you agree that voluntary euthanasia in hard cases was morally acceptable. Nevertheless, you won't be able to define the circumstances closely enough in which it is to be permitted, and you won't be able to police those conditions. It will just basically be unenforceable. There will be no way of holding the line against slippage in practice. And to support that argument, we can point to the Netherlands, where initially the Dutch said, we're only concerned to legalize voluntary euthanasia in cases of unbearable suffering. Incompetent people are at no risk at all of getting lethal injection. Well, critics said, you won't be able to hold the line, you won't be able to enforce your law. And indeed, the Dutch, through various government surveys, interviewing doctors under the guarantee of anonymity and immunity from prosecution, asked them, well, what are you doing? And the doctors, it said, were doing quite a lot of euthanasia, not only voluntary, but also in non-voluntary euthanasia as well. So in 1990, the first survey showed there were 2,300 cases of voluntary euthanasia, 400 cases of physician-assisted suicide. Those were permitted by the courts. But the doctors said, we're also giving lethal injections to a further 1,000 patients who made no explicit request for it. Those cases were clearly illegal but nevertheless were taking place. So practically the argument is you won't be able to define and police the safeguard. 
look at the Netherlands. But no less importantly is what's called the logical slippery slope argument. Um, and this argument runs, you'll, you'll end up with non-voluntary euthanasia, an euthanasia of people who are incompetent, not just because it's practically difficult to enforce them, of course it is, but once you endorse euthanasia on request to relieve someone's suffering, you are logically committed to endorsing non-voluntary euthanasia for the same reason. Now, of course, at first blush, you may say, no, no, that doesn't make sense. There's a clear difference. In the first case, there's a request. In the second case, there's no request. How can there be a logical link between the two? Well, actually, quite simply, think of it this way. Even in the case of voluntary euthanasia, so I go to Dr. Miller and say, Doctor, I'm suffering on there. Manchester United aren't performing well this year. <laughs> and uh, if I just got a terrible diagnosis, I'm miserable. Please uh, give me a lethal injection. Now, who decides whether I get the lethal injection? I mean, I've made no autonomous request for it, and I say I'm suffering. Dr. Miller decides whether I'm a deserving case for euthanasia. Dr. Miller decides whether death would be a benefit for me. And Dr. Miller may say, yes, I think your suffering is so serious, I'm going to give you lethal injection. Or he may say, no, I don't think your suffering is too serious. I'm not going to give you and quite often in the Netherlands, doctors say, no, I'm not going to give you an injection. That shows it's the doctor who's making the decision. And on what basis is a doctor making the decision? Not on the basis of my making an autonomous request, because I'm making an autonomous request in both situations. It's the doctor's judgment that death would be a benefit for me or would not be a benefit for me. So he's applying the principle of beneficence. He as a doctor is there, not just to give you what I ask for, however autonomously, but to benefit me. And once that penny drops, we can see the implications for patients who are not competent. Because Dr. Miller has exactly the same duty of beneficence to his patients who are not competent to ask for euthanasia. So if he gives me a lethal injection, he says, yes, Professor Keogh, you've asked for euthanasia, and I can see you're suffering seriously from cancer, of course I'll give you a injection. He then goes to the next patient who is in an identical situation to me, suffering severely from cancer pain. What's he to do? Is he to forget about his duty of beneficence to that patient? Well, the duty of beneficence persists even if there's no autonomy in it. So to summarize that argument, the logical simple love argument, it's argued that autonomy and beneficence are two reasons for euthanasia. The patient genuinely wants it, and the patient is suffering unbearably, let's say. But in the case of an incompetent patient who's suffering unbearably, you still have beneficence as a justification for euthanasia. Autonomy is not in play, it's not here nor there, but beneficence is. That's why the underlying case for even voluntary euthanasia is not autonomy. It's or autonomy plus beneficence. Beneficence is at the bottom what the euthanasia campaign is all about. And if you look at the expert evidence in the Carter case given by Professor Wayne Sumner and Professor Margaret Batson, they both openly support not only voluntary but non voluntary euthanasia as well. They see the logical end and they're quite open and honest about it. Remarkably, Justice Lynn Smith in Carter simply dismissed. This key argument. She said, it's not relevant because the plaintiffs in this case are only asking for voluntary euthanasia, so the logical scope argument is irrelevant. The judgment is no more misguided than that. And finally, a key part of her judgment concerns more, if you like, practical but also logical elements, which is can voluntary euthanasia or physician assisted suicide be safely controlled? What's the experience of those jurisdictions that have taken that step, chiefly the Netherlands and Belgium, that permit euthanasia and Oregon in the States, which permits physician-assisted suicide? She found on the basis of the expert evidence from those jurisdictions that it is possible to frame adequate safeguards against any slippage, against abuse. Um, now, it seems to me that finding is simply unsustainable. The reality from jurisdictions like the Netherlands is, as I mentioned before, widespread, flagrant breach of their guidelines. Their guidelines were set up to prevent voluntary euthanasia in case of unbearable suffering, 
their own official government surveys have shown thousands of cases in which patients have been killed without medical request, in clear defiance of the law, and also thousands of cases in which doctors have not bothered to report cases of euthanasia, again, in clear defiance of the law. So how Justice Lynn Smith can think that the Netherlands gives any support to her conclusion that effective safeguards can be drafted and enforced is really quite beyond the many of us who experience of uh, the Dutch in particular. So in summary, those are the arguments I'd like you to consider. Intention of foresight, right to suicide, logical and practical status of and the experience of those jurisdictions which have permitted euthanasia or assisted suicide. I think those are some of the elements of the debate. And uh, in fact, I welcome the increasing debate that's being had partly with the Elizabeth Carter case because it seems to me that the arguments against decriminalisation, although not given a fair hearing at all by the media in general, are much stronger than those in favour of decriminalisation. Thank you very much. jurisprudence so dramatically that it allows for, court, for lower courts 
uh, to depart completely from any Section 7 case, any Section 7 decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. Well, uh, the trial judge, Justice Smith, uh, said yes. The Court of Appeal, uh, I think, was a bit freaked out by that particular proposition because it would mean invalidating uh, all sorts of, of uh, case law, not just Rodriguez, but, but virtually any Section 7 case across the board. It, it, it was a, a floodgates problem. So they reined that back in and said, no, Rodriguez is still a controlling precedent. That leaves a lot open for the Supreme Court on appeal because the Supreme Court, of course, is not bound by its own precedents in the way that, uh, that the British Columbia Court of Appeal is. So a lot of these factual findings that Justice Smith had made about, about the uh, adequacy of safeguards and the rest, uh, those are still findings which are open for the, uh, the Supreme Court to deal with and to come to their own conclusions about whether this, whether the existing law um, is fundamentally just or not. So that's what's going on at the Supreme Court of Canada. Also, when we look over to Quebec, there's a, there's a, a, a play there to, uh, for, the, for the province uh, to authorize uh, what they're very, being very coy about calling them mentally dying, they mean euthanasia. Um, they're being coy about that because it's, it's clearly um, because of the operation of, of uh, the Division of Powers and the Federal Paramountcy. Uh, whatever Quebec manages to pass by way of legislation purportedly authorizing euthanasia is going to be in conflict with the criminal prohibition of that practice. And according to Paramountcy, when a provincial law and a federal law are in conflict, the federal law uh, prevails and the provincial law is inoperative. So it, it's a bit of a chaotic uh, quest that the, the Quebec government is on at the moment, but it's doing that uh, not just in this case, but rather, you know, more broadly across the board. Uh, so whatever, whatever they're trying to do, I don't think they're trying to succeed legally. <laughs> politically, who knows? But, uh, but that's where things sit as a matter of, uh, of litigation and litigation. Over to your questions. Thank you very much. I have lots of questions. I would like to ask them to throw open to the audience first. Does anybody want to kick things off? Any questions? If not, I will. Here we go. Let's ask um, Professor Keynes to talk a little bit more about the intention, foreseeability of intention. Because in my mind, it's, although it might be conceptually clear and apply, try and apply it, I think it becomes somewhat fuzzy. Um, because in, in my mind, foreseeability is an element of intention. Uh, and our Supreme Court has held that if you, if you foresee something that is substantially certain to occur, that you are deemed to have intended it. And I think in certain cases, it's much easier to say this is substantially certain, it's maybe certain. And in other cases, it's much, you know, right. it's a little unclear. Right? Two points, fuzziness and substantially certain. But firstly, I think, yes, it can be sometimes unclear what someone's intention is. Sometimes it's not, we're not entirely clear what our intentions are. Those are in the realm of factual determination. Did this, uh, was this person's intent to do this or was it to do that members of the jury? That's a matter beyond the basis of all the evidence. Sometimes it may be difficult to determine. Sometimes it may not. But I don't think that really undermines the conceptual distinction. So in, um, in uh, Rodriguez, Pinker himself recognized sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult to know or to determine what someone's intention was, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a difference between intention and foresight. Um, as the House of Lords Select Committee on Medical Ethics put it in 1994, juries make this decision every day of the week to determine what someone's intention was. Now, if it's the case then that the Supreme Court of Canada has held that if you foresee something that's substantially certain, then you intend it, they're wrong. Because you clearly don't. The doctor who administers the palliative drugs to ease your pain, merely foreseeing that it will shorten your life by hours, does not intend to shorten your life by hours. It's just a mistaken conflation of two states of mind. We often foresee things, for certain, not just substantially certain. You foresee the jet lag. You foresee the hangover. <laughs> if you drink too much. Um, but to say I intend the jet lag, I intend the hangover work is just <coughs> confusion. We, we don't. That's all. A very good article I'd recommend, one of the best I've read on this, was written by the Law Lord Lord Goff in the Law Quarterly Review, I think 1988. 
and um, he takes issue. Of course, there are law professors who, who do convey his intention, of course, like uh, Glanville Reed, following the footsteps of the uh, event. But Lord Goff, I think, very nicely replies to that conflation. And he gives plenty of examples. He, he gives you the example of uh, General Montgomery on D-Day sending in the British troops on D-Day, knowing for certain, not just substantially certain, knowing for sure lots of them will be mown down by the German machine guns. Did General Montgomery intend his men to be killed? Obviously not. So it's just a basic confusion to say General Montgomery intended his men to die because he knew they would. And in fact, exactly the same um, uh, scenario was posited by Chief Justice Rehnquist in the uh, Glucksburg case to make the distinction between intention and foresight. So I think that if the Canadian courts are going down that route, they're going down the route on their own. The US Supreme Court doesn't do that. The House of Lords hasn't done that. And for very good reason, for the reasons pointed out by Lord Garfield in that super law. In the appeal decision for a part, I felt like the only reason the majority didn't agree with the trial judge is because they were scared. They knew that it wouldn't really hold out to the Supreme Court because they didn't have the authority to make the decision. But under the Section 7 analysis, they didn't outrightly disagree with it. And in the Section 7 analysis being whether quality of life should be determined under the life standard or if it should just be the existential state. And I was wondering what your opinion would be as to what the Supreme Court of Canada would determine life is really in the Sure. I, I think that um, you might be a, a bit mistaken on, well, I, I read, anyway, the, I read the majority a little bit differently uh, on the question of, of life. Um, you know, the, the majority says that paragraph 280, the differentiating, because we recall uh, Justice Finch is very much in favor of uh, reading uh, life as including not just uh, your right to stay alive, but, but rather the, the whole, uh, uh, whole realm of existence. It, it's, it's encapsulated. All of liberty, all of autonomy so is, is wrapped up in, in the life of you. Uh, and the, uh, there's a clear wedge there between uh, him and, and uh, you know, the justice system. In our view, they say this differentiation in response to the Finch between life as an existential value and the values of individual autonomy and liberty, including the ability to enjoy the kinds of experiences described by Chief Justice Finch, is as it should be. Those who have a limited ability to enjoy those blessings are no less alive and have no less a right to life than persons who are able-bodied and fully competent. If life were regarded as incorporating various qualities which some persons enjoy and others do not, the protection of the charter would be expanded far beyond what the law can guarantee, while conversely a slippery slope would open up for those who are unable to enjoy the blessings described by the Chief Justice. So I, I think they're, they're <coughs> directly rejecting what you're suggesting that they've been a bit ambivalent about. Now where you're right, I think, is that uh, they, have, they, they have couched a lot of their argument, not in terms of uh, rejecting the findings that uh, Justice Smith made, but rather saying we're not, um, we don't have the authority to to, uh, to, uh, to uphold this decision. We have to follow the, the precedent. Uh, undoubtedly, they're doing that now. Why did they do that? I think, in, in part, there's um, uh, oddly, in, in, incomprehensibly, to my mind, uh, Crown Counsel didn't appeal any of the findings of that that were made by, by Justice Smith. They, they, Crown disagreed profoundly with those findings. Why they didn't appeal them, uh, I still have a satisfactory explanation for it. So this all gets kicked upstairs. But I don't think that, that uh, I, I don't think, I didn't, I didn't get the sense anyway that, um, that uh, the majority of the court was, was, was at all reluctant to do this in the, in the holding that it was making. Let me uh, put both of you on the spot with this question. Uh, what is the strongest argument in support of the position, first, uh, 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 establishing the unconstitutionality of the uh, prohibition on assisted suicide. Because there were four votes for it in 1993. There is, was discussion in this law school recently if the judges would have changed their mind and it had been revisited a few years ago. What's the strongest argument? I would think the strongest argument is, is simply uh, that, that people want it. That it, it's, it's very hard to say no to someone who is uh, who is in pain and believes that this will give them some uh, some measure of, of relief, either just in the, in the knowledge that they'll uh, that they have that option, or in, in uh, the belief that that itself is going to, to relieve them of a, uh, of a problem. Um, 
and that's that can be it's you know, certainly as uh, as an exercise of autonomy. But of course, it doesn't take into effect, take into account the impacts, the society-wide impacts of allowing those sorts of decisions to be uh, effective. Yes, it's a good question. I, I think either autonomy or beneficence, because those are the two strongest moral arguments. So those are the first two ideal. We've got this ten arguments in favour. And then reply to them, I put autonomy in essence, number one and number two. Um, so I guess it's tempting to go along with Brad there and say autonomy as a you know, push comes to shove, then autonomy, partly because of the enormous uh, emphasis that's placed on autonomy in the modern world, um, both uh, by ethicists and by ordinary people, um, particularly in the United States. So I think that def yeah, I think that would be a, that would be my answer as well. But ultimately the key argument it's my life, it's a private choice, it's a, one of the most important choices I've ever made, and who needs to tell me that I shouldn't be able to end my life in circumstances that I think are appropriate. I think that's probably going to be strong. Um, so following on from that, the autonomy question, mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in your thoughts on the role of very relevant. She said, look, we've got control over our bodies, so it follows from the fact that we have an absolute right to refuse treatment, that we have the right to euthanasia. Uh, of course, it doesn't follow, but, but she thought she didn't think it did. Because, of course, informed consent is more like a shield rather than a sword, so people, doctors can't impose treatments on without consent, but that doesn't give you a sword to go and demand intervention, so I think she was simply mistaken there. And, but there's another aspect to your question, which I think is very relevant, and it was touched on by Chief Justice Rehnquist in their leading case, Washington and Luxbury, because he said, well, it's alleged here that there's a constitutional right to indigenous to suicide, it's a limited right, it's for competent people, and he said, well, look at um, proxy decision makers. We allow other people to make decisions on behalf of incompetent people, either on the basis of, well, this is what they wanted, or this is what they would have wanted, or this is in their best interests. So again, by focusing on autonomy, one quickly sees that there are implications. It's not just the competent, presently autonomous person who can say, I've got to write to you the next one. It's the incompetent person's proxy who can say, well, Dr. Miller didn't actually ask for it before he fell into this coma, but I know Brad. You know, he wouldn't have wanted to live like this. So, I'm exercising his autonomy rights on his behalf, or I'm stepping into his shoes to make the kind of judgment he would want to. So I think um, it, it, it's, it's a mistake to think that the right to refuse treatment gives one a right to voluntary euthanasia or sense of suicide. Uh, on the contrary, <coughs> the argument cuts the other way. It shows how slippery the line actually is because the law relating to treatment does allow others to decide on one's behalf or for one, even if one's behalf. Over here. I just have a question about the logical slippery slope argument. Um, wouldn't the patient's volition factor into whether or not an act is beneficent? So, for instance, the doctors evaluate things, um, whether the act is good or not. I mean, shouldn't the fact that the patient wants it be a tricky factor of whether it's a good act or not? I don't quite see the exact yeah, no, I think that's a fair point, but in deciding what's for your good, what, what your view of the situation is, is relevant. So uh, the great Dr. Edmund Pellegrino, one of my dear colleagues at Georgetown, in explaining what the good of the patient is, emphasized the patient's own view of what their values were. But the situation <coughs> I'm dealing with is, let's, let's take a simple situation, um, a situation where you have a, a person who uh, is suffering to X degree and who requests euthanasia. There you have two reasons for giving them euthanasia. Let's just say now they're, they're in a coma but they're still suffering to the same degree. So why in that scenario shouldn't you 
make the same judgment. Let's say you just knew nothing about what they so they don't feed into at all. Maybe it was a patient who was never competent. Maybe it's a baby. Why can't you think that this degree of suffering just isn't good? This patient will be better off dead. If I'm prepared to give Dr. Miller a lethal injection because he's suffering to the X degree and asks for it, why shouldn't I do the same for this patient, whether it's a baby, or Dr. Miller who never mentioned anything about the situation? Because it's still the same degree of pain. Surely the benefit's the same. At least where the patient's not said anything. So, you know, Dr. Miller would say, well, I wouldn't want it. It might be a different situation. But the situation's where there's just no autonomy in play at all. You haven't got any input from the patient about what they think when you want in the situation. All you're left with is beneficence, ending the suffering. Now, does that argument only uh, work for physical pain? If, if, if the suffering is of a type that can only be experienced by someone who's conscious. I don't think, no. I, would, I don't think, if, if I were in favor of euthanasia, I, I would extend, as people who are in favor of euthanasia are, oh, they don't limit it to physical suffering. So I think in the Quebec bill, uh, it's not going to be, I think it's all the psychological yeah. as well. And why not? If, 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 you, if you're interested in the of suffering, there are all sorts of sources of suffering. And so uh, we could cite the Warren <coughs> cases before the Dutch Supreme Court, which concerned a woman who had lost two sons. One of her sons had died from cancer and the other had killed himself. And she just suffered from really serious grief. She couldn't get over the loss of her two sons. So she rang a voluntary United society in Amsterdam and said, no, I want physician-assisted suicide. And they put her in touch with a psychiatrist who saw her a few times. And he said, well, I just, I was just struck by how severe her grief was. And uh, I might have wanted to do more psychotherapy or more psychiatric treatments, but she didn't want to go there. So I helped her kill herself. And the Dutch prosecutors uh, said, well, Surely that can't constitute unbearable suffering. They prosecuted one of the rare prosecutions in the, in the Netherlands. And the Supreme Court disagreed. The Supreme Court said, no, that can constitute unbearable suffering, even though it's not physically based. So why not? Suffering is suffering. Back here. Uh, you spoke a lot about the statistics in the Netherlands mm -hmm. about uh, the thousands of cases of euthanasia that have occurred since the law's been put in and these unreported cases. But how prevalent do you think euthanasia is in Canada and the United States today? Really, how many cases are going unreported right now that could actually be benefit, benefited by a highly regulated uh, euthanasia? Industry? Yeah, that's, that's an argument that Professor Jackson uses, and I think there are two responses to it. One, I think the best evidence we have, and of course it's difficult to get an accurate picture of an illegal activity, but uh, if I talk about the UK, uh, we had a couple of surveys done by Professor Clive Seal of health professionals, and he found that the incidence of euthanasia was very low, and there was just no physician-assisted suicide. So he said the incidence of physician-assisted dying was extremely low, and he speculated that that's because of the good quality care culture in British medicine. Um, and surveys, I've said, in, in the US, seem to support that as well. Um, Linda Emanuel, I think, was involved in a survey showing that only a small minority of doctors had ever performed it. So it's sometimes said, one reason we need to change the law is because there's just rampant euthanasia going on, let's bring that into the open and control it. But the, the, the evidence just doesn't seem to be there. Certainly not in most of the UK, certainly not in most of the United States. Uh, and the second point is this, let's say Dr. Professor Seal's survey had found that doctors were getting lethal injections in a significant or significant high percentage of cases. What's the relevance of that argument to whether we should relax the law? It's tempting to say, well, if it's going on, if you know 10% of doctors are doing it, um, let's, let's regulate it. Let's bring it out into the open. But the counter argument is, well, all that will achieve is increasing the incidence of euthanasia. Because the opportunity for doctors surreptitiously to carry out euthanasia remains the same. Whatever guidelines you have, it'll always be up to the doctor to keep doing it in a clandestine fashion. 
So when the argument was using the Netherlands, let's bring it all out into the open, what they found was they weren't. If anything, they may have been generating more cases of euthanasia. Why? Because now it's socially endorsed, medically accepted, trained in medical schools, and taught in medical schools. So maybe you just all you succeed in doing is increasing the incidence of euthanasia. It strikes me as a similar argument to uh, some other litigation going on in the Supreme Court, which is the uh, legalization of prostitution, which is not technically, prostitution is not illegal, but everything around it is discouraged, and the same argument we made there, I suppose. That's making it, the argument is we should make this socially safer because it's happening anyway, but that on your account, doing that would encourage and make it socially acceptable for prostitution, you wouldn't necessarily deal with the bad prostitution that was causing all the harm that was involved in it anyway. There's certainly that argument. You know, it's not an issue I've, I've explored in any uh, depth, so I wouldn't want to sort of pronounce on the merits or not of legalizing prostitution. But, but certainly, it, it's naive just to assume that you legalize something, it's all nicely controlled and packaged and regulated. Um, that's not the case. I mean, going back to Glanville Williams, um, that's going back a bit, you know, who wrote really probably the first book on medical law and ethics or actually writing criminal law. Um, he was, of course, a very, uh, very uh, early advocate of um, relaxed laws on abortion. But he said, you've got to be realistic. Um, by legalizing it, it's not as if you're just going to stamp out back streets abortion. You are going to create it. Uh, a bigger incidence of abortion, you, you honestly accepted that. So there, there is that dimension to the gentleman's question. Thank you. In Carter, Justice Lynn Smith made a clear distinction between physician assisted suicide and euthanasia, uh, whereby the patient physician assisted suicide is the one who actually executes the means to end his or her life, whereas in euthanasia it's the doctor who administers the medication or however they choose to do it. And I think it goes to the gentleman's point to talk about abolition and intent. And in most of the talk you've commented on specifically euthanasia, but I wondered if you had an opinion on the physician assisted suicide perspective, whereby the patient is given the means to do so and chooses to exercise his or her autonomy, such as through a button or through actually doing the injection. I, I think I, I tend not to make much of a distinction. In fact, advocates for reform tend not to make much of a distinction either, at least philosophical advocates, because they and I would agree there's really not much difference morally or legally between the two. Just to illustrate that point, um, it's not always factually clear what, where the dividing line is. So if, um, if I ask Dr. Miller for you know, assisted dying, as, it, as, it, as Professor Jackson calls it, um, and he gives me a prescription, and I go off and fill it and take the tablets, then clearly a case of physician assisted suicide. Um, what if he actually puts the tablets on my tongue and I swallow them? Is that physician assisted suicide or is it euthanasia? What if he drops them down my throat? So sometimes it actually a, it, there's a blurred line between the two. But in terms of morality, it seems to me the arguments are substantially the same. And as we mentioned earlier, I think the two big arguments are autonomy and beneficence. So if out of respect for autonomy and beneficence, I can be given a lethal prescription, why can't I be given a lethal injection? Both arguments, it seems to me, for the first thing they endorse one, they endorse the second. The only reason that there's a distinction being drawn, it seems to me, in the modern world is because it's easier to sell position assisted suicide than voluntary euthanasia. Partly because of the connotations of the word euthanasia, but also because it seems to be much more patient controlled than voluntary euthanasia. But the Dutch make no <coughs> distinction. They say if you have a right to die, then you have the right to a lethal injection as much as the right to a lethal prescription. And I think they're right. The argument for autonomy and beneficence, if they justify euthanasia, if they justify position to the suicide, they justify euthanasia as well. Not least because there are some people, of course, who aren't able to kill themselves. So why should they be denied uh, a hasten death just because of their physical disability? I'm just intrigued by this idea of uh, having uh, carefully regulated uh, euthanasia. The Supreme Court of Canada in Rasul recently stated that, uh, or stipulated that doctors in Ontario cannot uh, unilaterally withdraw a patient from, an incompetent patient from uh, life support without the consent of the family. And if the family refuses, then 
we have what's called the Interior Consent and Capacity Board, where a physician can testify, I think it's in the best interest of the family, if legal representation can impose, and the patient has legal representation as well. So if we were to legalize euthanasia, it would be a good idea to have the uh, Ontario Killing Board with similar powers. And uh, but to protect patients from being concerned about doctors having the power to kill them as well as to care for them and cure them, this isn't a complicated procedure. Why shouldn't the chair, the chair of the Ontario Consent Capacity Board is a, uh, a lawyer? Why not empower that lawyer to give the lethal injection to those patients in order to remove that uh, uh, concern about uh, physicians having this power themselves? Well, I think in, in many cases, treatment withdrawal is relatively uncontroversial. The doctor is making a decision, hopefully in consultation with the patient and the relatives, it might be appropriate, whether this treatment is conferring any benefit any longer, or if it is, whether it's too burdensome to the patient. And most decisions can be resolved uh, without any great difficulty, it seems to me. Um, although in difficult cases, I think the courts are appropriate uh, organs for intervention and supervision of those decisions. Now, there's no way of getting away from treatment withdrawal decisions. They're part and parcel of everyday life. And there are opportunities for abuse. Doctors may make decisions wrongly in those cases, and more than favor of there being appropriate supervision cases. But euthanasia is not something we need to have in everyday life at all. It's, um, again, this is one of Emily Jackson's arguments. Is, look, look, people would withdraw treatment every day of the week um, without any judicial supervision, so why not euthanasia? And I think the answer is, well, we, we need to withdraw treatment in many cases. It's universally agreed to be ethical and appropriate. And in most cases, it's not difficult, controversial, in those controversial cases we can seek the assistance of the courts or some appropriate statutory body. But the argument doesn't follow that therefore we need to legalize euthanasia. We don't need to do that at all. So I, I think the argument collapses. The second point I want to make is that um, boards such as this may or may not be appropriate for treatment withdrawal, but um, some advocates of euthanasia would say, well, you can have, instead of the Dutch, who basically have fairly lax safeguards, the doctor files a report, consults with another doctor, and then files a report afterwards to a, a review committee which has many of these reports to, to look at um, with, with limited resources. Um, why couldn't we just have strict safeguards? such as a requirement that each case you've made has to go before a judge. And in fact, in, of course, in the D.C. Court of Appeal, you've got two of the justices floating this idea of a constitutional exemption in certain cases. Why not, you know, in every case, require the patient to go before a court? But I think an answer to that is, well, if doctors in the Netherlands, many of them aren't even bothered to file a report about what what prospect is there that doctors are actually going to take their patient and expose them and their patient to a, to a court hearing? Um, so that it's tempting to say, well, they may have problems in the Netherlands, but if you have stricter, more demanding safeguards, the patient will be protected. But as I put it in one of my books, I think the counter argument is it's like picking up a handful of sand and tightening and close your fingers, the more sand, sand slips through them. So it just doesn't follow that, the more demanding the regulation, the greater the degree of compliance. Yeah, it might be the opposite. This is the last question. Well, I really don't know. Uh, I saw two hands. We have two quick questions. Uh, sure, I was just going to say, you were talking about the decriminalization of suicide that's coming around from the idea that it was not the right thing, or the right way to treat the situation. Yeah, I have a question about the intentionality and foreseeability distinction. Um, so, 
I could cash out um, after euthanasia in a way in which my intention is not to kill the patient quite easy. I could say that my intention is to end suffering. It just turns out that in this case, the only way to end suffering uh, is to cause death of the patient, right? Just like the only way to cause the patient normally is going to be involving the death of people. Um, so I, I don't believe that that distinction uh, can do as much work as, as you argue it does. And also I'm curious, what intention is going on in the case of withdrawal of um, life support that could not stand in in the case of active euthanasia withdrawal? Because there is some intention going on. Um, and so why don't those intentionality arguments also apply to active euthanasia? Okay, I'll, I'll maybe do the second point first, the first one second, that's all right. Um, yeah, you can you can describe your intention in ending the patient's suffering as uh, my intention is to end the patient's suffering. But the question is what how how you do that? What are you doing to end the patient's suffering? But and yeah, say, well, I'm stopping his heart. So you are intending to end the patient's life as a means to the, the end of relieving the suffering. So virtually anyone who commits euthanasia, the Dutch doctors, may say Yes, our intention is to relieve suffering. Of course it is. But we're doing it by killing the patient. They make no bones about that. We're, we're, our intention is to kill the patient as a means to our end. So you can have two intentions. My intention is to end your suffering by ending your life. So I don't think by saying, well, I have other intentions as well, that my, my ultimate goal is this, that I'm going to do it by do, 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 you're intending a means. And that's how you be treated in the law. The doctor will be charged with murdering the patient, right? Because the doctor intended to kill, however compassionate, however good their further intention might be. Um, and the, uh, oh, uh, sorry, uh, withdrawal of treatment. As Chief Justice Rehnquist says in Glucksburg, when you withdraw treatment, you, you, you may intend to kill. He's not saying doctors never intend to kill when they withdraw treatment. Intention bears in the criminal law, maybe not in Canada anymore, but. In, in the UK and in, uh, in uh, the States. It's ordinary English meaning of purpose, goal, or aim. So if your aim in switching off that machine is to end the patient's life, then you are intentionally ending the patient's life, or be it by omission. Um, so you can commit euthanasia by omission. But as Chief Justice Rankin said, you need not be. You may be switching off the life support machine because you realize it's just conferring no benefit on the patient, patient's dying, this is just prolonging the dying process, therefore I'm going to withdraw it. Or it is conferring some little benefit but the patient's finding it extremely burdensome, so I'm going to withdraw it. Or the patient just refuses it. The doctor, I don't want to be hooked up to that thing. Okay, I'll take it away from you. The intention need not in any of those situations be to shorten the patient's life. Um, now the development. No, I'm not happy at all about just keeping you the laser <laughs> In fact, my closing words in my contribution are, it's time to euthanize the euthanasia debate because it is a serious distraction from what we ought to be doing, which is providing what the vast majority of people want and are not getting. Adequate palliative care, adequate social care. Um, there's, a, there's a desperate need for good end-of-life care. And I'm sure this is true in Canada as well as it is in England and in the United States. And this is a distraction from that real challenge of providing good quality end of life care for all who need it. Um, euthanasia, it seems to me, uh, although it sympathises with those who, who, who say they want it, uh, they are, I think, a relatively small minority of people, and the implications of allowing it for them would have serious ramifications for many, many other people, especially vulnerable elderly and disabled people. So I think the real challenge is not euthanasia. The real challenge is to improve palliative care. So my contribution is called against decriminalizing euthanasia for improving care. And I think euthanasia is a distraction from that important goal. Well, uh, it's a good time to bring things to a close. We thank you all for coming. Thanks for your patience at the start. Thanks for your great questions. Uh, and I ask you to join me in thanking Professor Miller, Professor Keon.